From the Samira Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO and MOG, where we bring together the world's foremost experts, the doctors dedicated to studying it, and the patients who live with it every day. With support from Genetech. Welcome. It's me, Chelsea Judge. I have been your host of Demystifying NMO, and I am so excited to be back to talk about season three of Demystifying NMO and MOG. So much good change to update you all on. And to do that, I'm pleased to be joined by the Sumaira herself. Sumaira, hello. How are you? Oh, hi, Chelsea. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Same. So Sumaira, um, do you know why I'm extra happy to be here today? Hmm. It's almost Wednesday, which means we're closer to the weekend. I do love hump day Eve, but actually (laughs) I'm even more excited because now I'm here in a full official TSF capacity. I've been so excited um, for the Connor B. Judge Foundation merger with the Samira Foundation. Oh, I know. Me too. I wanted you to say, but yeah, we're very (laughs) excited too. And you know, I've loved working with you over the years, but now doing it in this capacity is really exciting. It's super exciting. And, you know, we, we first came together, became partners on a mission that was at the end of 2019 when we kicked off Demystifying NMO, the podcast. And, you know, now I know that we can do even more great things together um, and just really amplify everything that we've both been doing. So really exciting. And also, I kind of already said it, but we have a new name for our podcast. Yay. Yay. And so the whole idea in mind, right, was to be more inclusive of our greater NMOSD and MOG AD community. So not just neuromyelitis, optica spectrum disorder, not just myelo, oligodendrocyte, glycoprotein, autoantibody disorder. Uh, gosh, those are such mouthfuls. Mm-hmm. Um, but that we're all one community. That's right. It's amazing, Chelsea, because you and I both came into this space around the same time. If I'm not mistaken, your brother Connor was diagnosed relatively around the same I was. Yes, yeah, so which was eerie <clears throat> or kismet or whatever. Right. And so that was 2014. The MOGAD antibody had not even mm-hmm. been discovered yet. So, so many patients who were in our community um, with the diagnosis of seronegative NMO, turns out they're MOG positive. So then what do you do? And I didn't feel it was right to separate this community. So I said, you know what? Let's keep it together. Let's keep the fam together and illuminate NMOSD and MOGAD. So here we are in 2022. Uh, TSF now advocates for both, and our podcast will include content, coverage, updates, guests, and participants from both the NMOSD and MOGAD communities. Thank you so beautifully and eloquently said. Um, Yeah, distinct diseases, and of course, important to get the most accurate diagnosis, um, you know, for treatment-wise and prognosis, but also within NMO and MOG, there's lots of overlap scientifically, clinically, emotionally. So it truly is important to keep that in community. Um, And on a personal level, yeah, my brother, Connor, he was diagnosed as NMOSD zero negative, later found to potentially have at least low levels of MOG. So on a personal level, it's just highly relevant and I'm even more passionate um, to keep the community together, strength in numbers. But Samira, wait, there's more. We also have another big new update. Do you want to say it or should I? I can say it. We have a new host. Yay! Yay! Our new host, Brian Dawson, has a master's in library and information services. He's also a TSF ambassador and now demystifying NMO and MOG host. Welcome, Brian, and thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and be part of things. Brian is probably one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. I may get in trouble for saying that, but I really do mean it. I'll never forget the first time I met Brian. He is a man of a few words, but when he speaks, it's always so profound and something really important. And I feel like every time I talk to him, 
I learned something new. So when we were thinking about expanding the program, um, the podcast, Voices of NMO, Voices of Mog, and all the other stuff that Brian's now working on, he immediately came to mind. So Brian, thank you for doing all of this work and for trusting us. Thank you for the kind words. I'm just excited to be part of the project. Brian, I have a question for you. As the program manager and now the host of season three, what can the audience expect? We are going to be bringing together the researchers and the doctors who are moving the medicine forward and the people who live with the disease every day. So our goal is to kind of be the confluence of science and pragmatism. We want to put out reliable evidence-based information and make sure that it's understandable for every person who needs answers to their questions. On the flip side, we want to make sure that the lived experiences of our community uh, can be helpful to healthcare providers so they can understand the impact illness has on us as people and how we can work together to improve patient-centered outcomes, our outcomes. Nobody has as much at stake in this as we do. So this season, we're going to be talking about topics like the evolution of NMO and now MOG. Are they the same? What's different? Is there any, any overlap? Why is it important to keep our community together? Uh, we'll be talking about health literacy and how good information can help us make better health care decisions. We're also going to talk about service animals, nutrition, resiliency, the impact that NMO and MOG can have on a career, and navigating the financial challenges that comes with chronic illness. So there's definitely a lot for us to talk about. Wow, that sounds like a really exciting season. Yes, Brian, I'm so excited to work with you and support the pod as best as I can. But I am just so excited for this because the pod demystifying NMO and MOG is in great hands with you. Thank you. Let's get into season three and have our first conversation on NMO and MOG. Hello to you both. Um, I'm Chelsea Judge with the Sumire Foundation. I'm on the pod today with Brian Dawson. He's our new podcast program manager. And I'm on, we're really lucky and fortunate to have Dr. Michael Levy, MD, PhD of the NMO Clinic of MGH. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Chelsea and Brian. And so I thought maybe first things first, what we're going to talk about today is differentiating um, or demystifying the NMOSD and MOG AD spectrum. Um, we really want to emphasize that while there's, of course, like important clinical distinctions, treatment approaches to NMO and MOG, um, that it's all a part of this overall spectrum and that we're all in it together. So could you tell us a little bit, Dr. Levy, about your background um, and how you came to work within NMOSD and MOG? So I started my residency at Johns Hopkins in the mid-2000s. And... Um, at the time, we had a lot of patients who were being misdiagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis, because that's the diagnosis we knew at the time. We didn't have blood tests for NMO or for MOG, but they didn't have MS. They, were, they had NMO and they had other diseases. And they would come into the hospital and they'd say, you know, doc, I've been doing everything right, whatever my doctor told me I was doing, and I'm getting worse and worse and worse. And then when these blood tests for NMO and MOG became available, NMO in 2005 and MOG in 2017, we recognized that they were different, that they were different from MS, that their treatments were different. And at Johns Hopkins, at least, where they were doing a lot of trials in MS, these patients were messing up the trials. You don't want non-MS people in MS trials. And so I became interested in them because of the interesting biology and then MS doctors were like, please take them take them to your own clinic and treat them separately so that they don't mess up our studies. And just around that time, we started doing trials in NMO and we only had aquaporin-4 antibodies at the time. And anyone who did not have aquaporin-4 antibodies, I think they kind of felt left out. They wanted to be in the family. So we held on to them. And as the MOG antibody rolled out, we started diagnosing a lot of MOG patients there's still a nice sizable population that don't test positive for either one, but we're not letting anybody go because as new antibody tests come out, we're able to recognize them and diagnose them correctly. 
Thank you so much. And you kind of already emphasized like the path or the process to which MOG has been recognized now as its own separate um, entity or disease state from NMO. Um, could you tell us more in your experience in the clinic, how do NMO and MOG patients might present differently or, you know, also at the same time, what are some overlaps? Yeah. And initially I would say they present the same. It's really hard for me to predict if someone's going to have NMO or MOG when they come in with their first attack. They might be blinded in one eye. They might have weakness, numbness, or even paralysis and bladder dysfunction. And when they first, when a patient first comes in, it's hard for me to predict sometimes. There are some clues that would help me. For example, young white men tend mm -hmm. to be more MOG. Older black women tend to be more aquaporin four. Just, just statistical demographics tend to segregate that way. But a lot of other features are very much overlapping. And we do depend on these antibody tests, which are very specific. So there are only um, 60 or so cases worldwide where the antibody tests are positive for both aquaporin 4 and MOG. But it's pretty clear in most of those cases which one is more dominant in, in terms of the clinical features. So most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're testing positive for one or positive for the other. And then we're able to really make better predictions about what the recovery looks like and which treatments they'll respond to. Another thing that's really different between MOG and Aquaporin 4, it's not evident right away, but it's evident when they come back to clinic the first time, is that a MOG patient is going to see a lot better and is going to walk a lot better at that three or six month time point when they come to my clinic. Whereas Aquaporin 4, that healing process is much longer and it's not as complete as with MOG. From a nerdy perspective, um, that recovery where you're saying that, you know, some patients with MOG might have a potentially better ability to see or recover, um, is that thought to be the target of the antibody, right? Where you're targeting this myelin component versus the aquaporin on these other neuronal cell types? I think so. I think since MOG targets myelin, MOG is a protein that's expressed in the outer surface of the myelin sheath. That's the destructive process we see on the pathology underlying the disease. With aquaporin-4, the target is the astrocyte supportive cell. About 85% of the cells in your brain are these supportive cells, and they're targeted in aquaporin-4 NMO, but they don't just pick those off. They, it's, it's more like a bomb going off. So it's not just a few cells that are dying or a little bit of myelin that's being peeled away. It's really a much, much more destructive process. And then there are no supportive cells there left over to aid in the healing process. So it's it's sort of a, a, a dual bad news for aquaporin 4. You get bad inflammation to begin with, and then you don't have the support for the healing process. Oh, thank you. It's horrible, but fascinating. Um, so... Kind of continuing on, I understand that it's the importance of these antibody tests specifically to look for the aquaporin 4 antibody or MOG um, antibody. What else are important uh, key factors in differentiating the diagnostic criteria? Anything else of note other than the antibody tests? Yeah, MRI is very useful. There are certain MRI features that are common for NMO and MOG and some that are really different. NMO has... Um, uh, area postrema lesions. These are the attacks that cause nausea, vomiting, and hiccups. MOG really does not. MOG lesions in the brain and spinal cord can be much smaller than NMO, which tends to be much longer and more destructive. And the brain MRI in NMO tends to be relatively spared, but with MOG, you can often see some lesions in MOG I've seen are, are horribly large and scary looking, although not as destructive again because the healing process is better. Although I should say with MOG, even though they heal better after each attack, it's the cumulative destruction, the healing and the attacks and the heals and the attacks and the healing. Over time, it does leave behind some residual dysfunction. A lot of my patients will have cognitive issues, fatigue, and um, attention deficit, and a lot of other problems associated with MOG attacks. And Obviously, as you already hit upon, that there was a lot of overlap and misdiagnosis of NMO and MOG patients with MS, given the clinical presentation and the lack of uh, the antibody testing, um, really just as you said, for MOG just as recently as five years ago. 
Um, but it seems like there, I see even potentially more overlap with the MOG patients and um, MS patients, as you're saying that they have some ability to recover after those initial attacks, like a lot of relapsing MS patients, um, but it's that accumulated inflammatory attack that can kind of curb their ability to recover over time. Would you, do you see some overlap more so with MOG patients and MS? Absolutely. MOG and MS have a lot more overlap. So MOG overlaps with MS in that regard. Patients do heal better. MS patients, their attacks are not quite as severe as MOG, but the healing is better with MS and it's better with MOG. Um, one major difference though between MOG and MS is that MS seems to progress despite our best effort to prevent future attacks. Whereas with MOG, our best guess right now is 95% of cases will not progress in the sense that if you stop any future attacks, you should never be worse than you are. So we don't see a lot of progressive disease with MOG, and that's a really good piece of news for MOG patients. You know, if I had to have an autoimmune disease of my brain and my spinal cord, and I had to pick among those three, um, NMO is the most destructive, and MS is the least destructive, but over time has that progressive phase, which can land you in a wheelchair, even with best therapy. And MOG, although the attacks are severe, the recovery is best, and there's no progressive phase, and now we're getting better at preventing MOG attacks. So if I had to order them in terms of severity, I would say MOG is the least severe, followed by MS, followed by NMO aquaporin 4. I think outside of the NMO MOG world and MS world, having a conversation of which uh, CNS autoimmune disease would you prefer sounds a bit weird, but I totally understand um, based on um, you know your categories. Um, so it seems like overall with MOG and NMO, while they're both like these acute demyelinating disease, um, AQP4 can be a bit more destructive because of the nature of the target of being on these astrocytes, as you emphasized, being more nourishing and supportive um, versus the myelin. Um, which gets targeted in both MS and MOG. And it seems like within MOG disease, it's even more tied with that like acute or uh, of the moment um, demyelination and it matches the relapses and matches the MRI versus in MS. Um, you don't really see that. You, it's more of like this slow burn over time. That's right. That's a good way to think about it. And it seems like, therefore, we're kind of already getting at the natural next question is that the prognoses you've already highlighted, the prognoses do differ amongst AQP4 um, and MOG patients. The other interesting thing about MOG is that sometimes it goes away. Mm. Multiple sclerosis never goes away. About 10% of cases are considered to be benign in the sense that even without treatment, patients tend to do well, can avoid a wheelchair forever. Um, but with MOG, we have even higher rates of what we think of as, as total remission, where antibody levels drop and sometimes go away and relapses don't occur and you can come off of treatment. We see this in not only people who have a single attack, but even people who have multiple MOG attacks, who over time are able to keep the immune system calm. It seems like the the immunity to MOG, this idea that the immune system wants to target and attack MOG, it tends to wane over time as long as you keep the immune system calm for a few years. Now, how many years? We don't know. Uh, my colleagues at the Mayo seem to think it revolves somewhere around four years. And I think that's fair, two to four to six years sometimes. But at some point, the immune system finally says, okay, um, you're not going to let me attack MOG. I'm just going to give up. And so a lot of MOG patients have a really good long-term outcome if you're able to keep the disease in remission. More to your point of if you're going to have to pick one of these, you picked MOG. Um, before we continue more with the prognoses for AQP, AQP4 patients, I, I think that as we're learning more about uh, MOG and, you know, these overall uh, antibody-mediated diseases, um, what what is the prevalence or frequency of patients who are misdiagnosed with either NMO or MS who are actually MOG positive? So you're asking about NMO patients who might actually be MOG? Yes, and then same thing for MS patients who yeah. might actually be MOG, yeah. About one in five NMO patients is aquaporin-4 negative and has not yet had the MOG test, mm -hmm. I would say is a smaller proportion. Um, 
I, I don't know the exact number, but if you look at all among all people who tested negative for aquaporin 4, the positive rate of MOG antibodies is about 40%. So then there's still a nice chunk of aquaporin 4 negative patients who are negative for MOG, and we don't know what they are yet. And then uh, among MS patients, it's even more complicated because there's there are levels of MOG antibody that are reported out. You might have low levels on the range of one to 20, one to 40. About half of those cases have a, a clinical presentation that looks a lot more like MS. Mm -hmm. And although MS does not have a blood test, mm -hmm. there's a debate raging about people who have low MOG titer, low MOG levels, but a clinical picture of MS, What? who are those patients? Are they MOG MS? Are they MOG? Are they MS? What, what are we going to call them? What does their outlook look like? What does their response to treatment look like? That's still an area of research. It's really the high level MOG antibodies that we're much more confident about. And if a, an MS patient tests positive with a high level of antibodies, we can reliably move them to the MOG clinic. So I'm seeing a bit of overlap, right? We have these antibody mediated diseases um, they all are treated to some degree with immune modulation or immune suppression. Um, I can see then, right, B cells make antibodies, deplete the B cells or modify the B cells. So um, do, would you or do you, um, uh, there, what is the overlaps in treatment approaches? Is it with B cell depletion or are there other overlaps? B cell depletion does wonders for multiple sclerosis. It's my favorite approach for treatment of MS. For NMO, it's also wonderful on the range of 80% response rate, meaning one in five people might have a relapse despite using B cell therapy, mm -hmm. but four out of five respond with, with NMO. And there is an approved, FDA approved therapy for both NMO and for MOG that depletes B cells. But MOG is different. Obviously, the, when we first made the diagnosis of MOG and we didn't know what treatment they'd respond to, we picked up B cell therapy drugs because we were so comfortable with them in NMO and in MS, but they didn't quite work as well. And I remember sitting around a table in <laughs> Berlin with other with my colleagues, and we were all just kind of speculating, you know, why don't are you are you seeing the same thing that I'm seeing with B cell drugs? They don't quite work for MOG. And everybody's like, Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true for me too. And we kind of put all put our data together. And I had five patients, someone else had five patients. We ended up with a hundred something patients and the response rate to rituximab was about 35 to 40 percent. So meaning six in ten patients will have a relapse of MOG despite B cell therapy. And that's not a very good rate. Now rituximab is very, very safe to try. So if you're in that four out of 10 group, that's great. If, if you relapse and you suffer some damage as a result of that relapse, we're not really happy with that. So as a first-line agent, um, I don't reach for rituximab for MOG anymore. We have other options. Intravenous immunoglobulin IVIG is wonderful, in my experience, for MOG. And we put together a series of those cases where the high dose of IVIG is about 80% effective. And it's not effective for MS or for NMO. It's only effective for MOG. So these treatment specificities are really beginning to emerge now that because the diseases are di are different, it's not a surprise that they're responding to different treatments. Very interesting. So I, once again, this is just highlighting how important it is to get the most like the appropriate, accurate diagnosis because it's going to affect your long term prognosis, your treatment approach. That's right. Fascinating. Oh, thank you so much for that. I did not know um, that nuanced data on treatment response with B-cell depletion in MOG patients. Um, once again, this is like the importance of getting closer to something like personalized medicine. Um, I assume that just as we have way more data on MS patients because we understand it more, it was the, the only diagnosis available to these demyelinating conditions for so long, there's way more data on MS, maybe then more data on NMO, then therefore less data on MOG. Would it tear like that? It is, but I would say that MOG is the newest, most exciting disease, and you can't go to a neurology meeting or pick up a neurology journal without seeing something about MOG. So um, yes, it probably does have the least information, but there's a lot of excitement around research for MOG. I love to hear that. So 
the future then? It seems like it's very promising. Um, I remember 2019 was considered the year of NMO, maybe in the next couple of years, or this is the moment for MOG. How would you forecast yeah. the future? Well, the first um, phase three trial for MOG launched this year, and patients have been enrolled in the US and in Japan. And um, the second phase three trial was launched as well this year and enrolled patients in Germany. And um, I think both of these trials are expected to read out in 2025. I know that sounds like a long time, but that's how long these Aquaporin 4 trials took also. So maybe 2025 will be the year for MOG. I love to hear it. Could you tell us just a little bit more of like a sneak peek? Like what are these treatment approaches? What are, What is the targets of these clinical trials? Yeah, the first trial is a drug uses a drug called rosanolixizumab, which Ooh. people shorten the, to rosumab, much simpler. And the way that this drug works is it kind of does the same thing as IVIG. I told you how wonderful IVIG is for MOG. Rosanolixizumab does, does the, kind of the same thing that IVIG does, but in a more specific way, a simpler way. It depletes your own antibodies very quickly through a recycling method that you already have in your body. And you get this drug weekly. It's too large of a volume to get as a shot. So you have to do uh, this um, subcutaneous infusion through a patch. It's a little bit complicated, but it's only once a week. And um, basically any disease where I IVIG is useful, this drug has been useful. So MOG is, is the next to be tested. and um, that study is expected to enroll just over 100 people, and only one relapse will be allowed. So it's a time to first relapse. If you have a relapse, you're then rolled over into the, the unblinded portion of the study. Unfortunately, the only way we could design this trial, since it's the first phase three trial, was to include a placebo arm. So half of patients will get placebo through the infusion, and half will get the real drug. But again, after one relapse, everyone then gets the drug. The second trial that launched is with satrolizumab. The brand name is Enspring. That might sound familiar to some Aquaporin 4 patients because it is approved for NMO Aquaporin 4 since 2020. This trial was launched because people came together and said, you know, I do feel like this drug, the predecessor to satrolizumab is called tocilizumab. People kind of got together in those same kinds of meetings and said, I think tocilizumab has been useful. How about you? And again, we put all of our cases together and it does seem to be useful. And the company paid attention. And um, since MOG is kind of a close cousin to Aquaporin 4, it wasn't a very difficult trial designed to launch. So they were able to put that together. It's another phase three trial. It is placebo controlled also. But just like the satulizumab trial in Aquaporin 4, people in this trial who are on placebo are allowed to use Cellcept mycophenolate, which has some benefit in MOG. And so the hope is that it would kind of mitigate that placebo risk a little bit. So both of these trials are expected to read out in 2025. And I'm going to make a prediction here. I think they will both be useful. They'll both reach their target. And I think both will be approved for MOG. Obviously, we love to hear that, and especially it seems like we're going to have a potential slightly new um, like treatment approach with the revamped IVIG treatment, um, so this is all very exciting. Indeed, I agree. Well, thank you so much. We, again, are really grateful to have your expertise and your compassionate um, information uh, so much. Brian, do you have any other added comments or questions? I don't. You just covered everything and you just covered everything so well. I feel like I was just in a master class. So that was why I was so glad. <laughs> I appreciate being able to uh to listen in as it was happening. Wonderful. Thank you.